Pope Francis's restrictions on the celebration of the traditional Latin Mass have been working their way through dioceses all over the world, including here in the U.S. With analysis of that and much more is president of the Acton Institute and author of the new book, The Economics of the Parables, Father Robert Sirico. And I should mention, today is Father's birthday. Father Robert, happy uh, birthday. Thanks for being here and sharing with thank us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very before much. Before we get to the book, I want to begin with a Father's Day reflection given this past weekend in Chicago's old St. Patrick's Church. Now, instead of a homily following the gospel, the celebrant invited two men to offer a Father's Day gospel reflection. Listen. And of course, today is Father's Day, and conveniently, we tick both of those boxes. Let us be honest, there are probably not too many gay dads speaking on Father's Day at many Catholic churches on the planet today. They went on to describe the miracles of their marriage and the adoption of daughters. Content aside, Father, how does this square with canon law? It states very clearly that a homily should be reserved for a priest or a deacon. That's true. Uh, there's only uh, an exceptional circumstance that the priest is unable to preach. Uh, but uh, so just just on the basis of lay people giving a homily, but usually when this is done, the priest will kind of cover by saying, well, it wasn't the homily, it was a reflection. But um, mm. uh, we know it, if it walks like a duck, that's what it is. Mm. Is this illicit? No, no, very clearly, according to the canons, it's not listed. I wonder if uh, mm -hmm. the archdiocese has made any statement clarifying this or if the None priest himself has uh, offered a justification. Let me uh, share this with you. The Catholic Church also does not recognize same-sex unions. And in 2006, the U.S. Bishops' Conference explained that it doesn't support the adoption of children by same-sex couples. So what do you think is going on here in Chicago? <laughs> What do you think is going on in Chicago? It's very clear what's going on in Chicago, at least in this parish, that uh, they are pushing the bounds. I mean, it, it's interesting that in that comment that the gentleman made uh, about being Pride Day and Father's Day and all the rest of it, mm -hmm. he said, uh, this is not going on in many Catholic churches. Well, why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's contrary to the teaching of the church and her liturgical norms. Mm. Chicago's Cardinal Blaise Supich announced a comprehensive liturgical policy after the Congregation of Divine Worship, the Vatican's liturgical office, issued instructions on the extraordinary form of the Mass last December. Now, following Pope Francis's apostolic letter, Tradiciones Custodes, Supich banned the celebration of Mass in the Ad Orientum posture, that's facing east, or so-called away from the people, without permission. Priests who are Get, who receive the permission to celebrate the extraordinary form of the Mass must also celebrate the new Mass, one Sunday a month, as well as Christmas and the Tridium and Pentecost, and the readings, of course, have to be in the vernacular. In his letter announcing the new norms, Supich told Chicago priests to, quote, faithfully adhere to the liturgical norms, so that as the body of Christ, our worship of God may always enrich and never diminish the faith of our people. Is this adhering to liturgical norms, Father? When you allow uh, lay people up in the in the uh, lectern to offer homilies, uh, I, I mean, it seems to me instead of banning Latin Mass, where the rubrics are pretty fastidiously observed, what about cleaning up these uh, aberrations in the new Mass? No, I think you're very right to point out this contradiction, and it it's really self. Immolating. If you're going to try and impose a set of liturgical norms against traditional forms of worship, but not impose the set of norms, in other words, you're destroying norms altogether, and you're just a will to power here. What you want to do, what you feel you want to do to respond to a, a particular political current or a, a season. And it's really making a hash of the whole uh, liturgical sensibility of the church, which is important mm. not just for its style, but for its prayer and theology. Remember that lex orandi, lex credendi, we pray as we believe. Belief informs uh, our prayer. And what's happening here is a complete confusion and chaos in the whole matter. So it, it collapses 
uh, any kind of expectation of, of fulfilling the norms of the church. And if that happens, uh, it can cut any which way. According to reports, Father, I want to move, because this is an interesting area, and, and again, um, the church teaches one thing, but as you said, we, we worship as we believe. Well, th then that worship has to be uh, adhered to the beliefs of the church. There are reports a right. church in Bologna has staged the first public blessing of a gay couple in Italy. Uh, a diocesan communique denies the claim, saying it was a mass of thanksgiving for a group called In Camino, On the Way, which aims to accompany and offer support uh, in the Christian life for people with homosexual tendencies. However, photos of the two men standing at, in the front of the altar wearing boutonnieres and suits and later having rice thrown on them outdoor the church suggest otherwise. The Diocese of Bologna, incidentally, is headed by Archbishop Matteo Maria Zuppi. He is the newly appointed president of the Italian Bishops' Conference. Now, Zuppi was apparently aware of this Mass of Thanksgiving, according to the pastor, on June 11th. Your thoughts on your, what do you make of this blessing taking place in Zuppi's archdiocese? Well, I mean, it's obvious, the same thing that we said in, in the Chicago context, but here's the really frustrating thing about this, is it's not being honest, it's being disingenuous. If you want to dissent from the church's teachings, say it. Say exactly what you believe and what you don't believe, and then let the consequences fall. Uh, but what's happening here is this duplicity, and it, it really bespeaks a lack of authenticity uh, in the name of authenticity. Uh, it lacks uh, a clarity. Um, it, it, you know, and, and let's remember that uh, heresy is truth gone mad, the old saying goes. So that there's a truth in the middle of all of this, and it's what the Catechism says about people of same-sex orientation being treated with dignity and with respect. No unjust discrimination, the Catechism says. And that is just. But what they are doing here is undermining the very authority of the Catechism that calls for the proper treatment of people with same-sex orientation. Hmm. In 2021, following on that, uh, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith confirmed that same-sex blessings by Catholic priests are not licit. Uh, now, they're claiming in Bologna this is a mass of thanksgiving to get around that rule. Uh, are, do you expect to see more of this? Well, we're seeing it. That's exactly the kind of argument that's being used in Chicago. This isn't a homily. Uh, this, we're not saying anything about homosexual actions. You know, it's, again, it's duplicitous. And if these uh, incidences are not uh, stopped in one way or another if the uh, authorities, uh, like uh, Cardinal Zuppi uh, or Cardinal Supic, uh, don't put some censure on the priests who are behaving this way, of course we're going to see more and more of this kind of thing. And then what happens when more traditional people want to ignore the cardinal in, in terms of the way and the style of their liturgies. I mean, it, it, again, it gets down to chaos. Let's remember that the name of uh, another name for the devil is the dissembler, the one who breaks things apart. Mm. It lies. Yep. And uh, let's just be honest about this. You, you claim to want authenticity. You claim to want truth. Then let's just have an honest discussion about these things. Yeah. The Vatican has issued a new collection of commemorative coins, Father. Um, a new one, it's a 20-euro piece. It has a depiction of a young person receiving a vaccine. Uh, the description on the Vatican website states that the 20-euro coin is dedicated to the current theme that's very close to Pope Francis's heart. The Holy Father has repeatedly stressed the importance of vaccination, recalling that health care is a moral obligation and it is important to continue efforts to immunize even the poorest of people, end quote. Your thoughts on this coin and the timing of the release? Well, what strikes me is how trendy this all is. Uh, it's coming at a time where, uh, pray God, this this whole pandemic and shutdowns are is subsiding, uh, and it's holding up a, a kind of trendy. There's a, a, a kind of virtual signaling that's been going on during the whole thing, both with the masks and and with the uh, the whole vaccine. Uh, uh, debates that, that have taken place where the mm -hmm. church says that it has always given us the option 
with regard to vaccines. It's not mandatory in our Catholic mm -hmm. faith. So it's a stylistic thing. It's a trend. They're putting it on a coin. So maybe there's, a, you know, I can't wait to see the next coin. I mean, maybe we'll have, uh, you know, oral health care and toothbrush uh, uh, <laughs> virtue. Well, if you, I, I worry if you turn that vaccine coin over, it might be sponsored by Pfizer. But we'll take a close look to they, make sure oh, that that's the case. That would be a great uh, marketing idea. Great. Yeah, well, at least somebody would pay for this thing. Uh, I want to talk sure. for a moment about your new book, The Economics of the Parables. Uh, you have mined yes. the parables here for economic wisdom that often goes unseen or unnoticed. Why? Well, because what Jesus is doing, and he does it not just with these things that have economic dimensions, but in all of life, he's teaching us something about eternity from the context of scarcity, of the real world, of the earth. And uh, these 13 parables that I've chosen, there could be more that I could have written on, really give us examples and, and bespeak the uh, knowledge that our Lord has of the reality of scarcity and the necessity of uh, allocating resources properly in a way that serves the the human community. And you see this yeah. in repeat. I mean, the parable of the talents is one great example. We don't have the time to go through through all of them. But if you think about it uh, for a moment, you can you can see that things like trade, wage rates, uh, uh, inheritance disputes, uh, discovery of valuable things that were hidden or not discovered before, uh, all of these things are in these gospels. And what I try to do is uncover the the kind of consequences uh, uh, of this kind of thinking. It's, it, mm -hmm. it, it really, I think, will be surprising. I think there's some new things in there that people would not have thought of. Much of Catholic social teaching, Father, condemns socialism and Marxism. However, we have seen various elements of capitalism condemned by the current pontificate. Even Pope Benedict and John Paul were dubious of certain parts of market capitalism. Um, Pope Francis said capitalism failed during the pandemic of 2020. The Pope has repeatedly rejected trickle-down economics in his encyclical uh, Brothers All and the 2013 Evangelium Gaudium. What do you make of the Pope's statements on the evils of capitalism and condemnations of trickle-down economics? Well, um of course, there are things in capitalism that uh, can be condemned that I would join in condemning. Uh, somebody once said that the socialism condemns so. Uh, I'm sorry, the church condemns socialism at its root, but only condemns capitalism in its branches. And there are things that are on the market that are immoral that should be condemned, that even should be outlawed. But that is not uh, because. In other parts of uh, Fratelli Tutti, for example, the Holy Father says that business people with an ethical uh, orientation, with a primacy of uh, human dignity uh, and under law, can be uh, uh, indispensable in benefiting the poor. And that's the capitalism or the free market that we want to defend. I think that it's unfair and it reveals a kind of inconsistent way of thinking and a, a lack of depth of economic understanding. In the book, you write about the story of the rich man encountering Jesus and asking him what it will take to enter the kingdom of heaven and how this is often misinterpreted. You write, here is where the famous phrase so often recounted in discussions about wealth and economic success arises. How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. That vivid metaphor, which comes midway through the account, is perhaps its most memorable part. Jesus' words are often seen as a denunciation of wealth or an indication that wealth is incompatible with discipleship. What is it that people get so wrong about this moment in Jesus' life and this encounter? The important thing that people are missing right here is the first thing that Jesus says to the rich man. He invites him to come and be his disciple. We could have had 13 apostles had he accepted the Lord's invitation. But what is the first thing that he says? And I'm going to give everybody a moment to think about that. And they're going to think, I'll bet the majority will say, <laughs> well, Jesus told him to give away everything. But that's not the first thing he tells him. The first mm. thing he says is go and sell 
all that you have. In other words, he's in admonishing him to first engage in commerce. Now, think about that for a moment. If yeah. there is a connection between this man's wealth and the distribution to the needy and the poor, and our Lord tells him to sell it, then wouldn't you think that the Lord expects the man to get a good price on, on the things that he's selling. In other words, he's engaging in commerce, and it shows the connection between his successful entrepreneurship, his marketing, and his service of the poor. And that, to me, is a metaphor yeah. for the market as a whole. I'm not saying that Jesus is trying to teach us economics here, but what I'm trying to say is that it does not indicate that our Lord is prejudiced against people who have wealth. He wants them to prioritize. The, the, the scriptures you just read, it says, those who put their trust in wealth. Mm. We cannot put yeah. our trust in wealth. How does this whole story end? It ends with Jesus answering the disciples' question when they say, well, then who can get into heaven? If the rich can't right. get into heaven, who can get into heaven? And he says, what? With man, all things. With man, it is impossible. With God, all things are all possible. Things. Mm. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, and our it's Lord a had very rich and, friends, uh, insight. too. Yeah, well, that's uh, true. No, he did rich in, in a circle. Joe. Yes, he, he went to the cross with with a, a, a civil row suit, in effect. He the, the seamless garment was a very valuable garment. And our Lord goes, so where did he get that? He got that maybe from Joseph of Arimathea. What do you want people to learn from the book and from these parables that are often misinterpreted or misunderstood? A parable means something that is side by side. Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like. And what I want people to learn is where we are right now in our world of scarcity can indicate to us something transcendent, something that has no scarcity, the eternal kingdom of heaven. It's not how to buy and trade and make money. It's how to get to heaven. And that's by the grace of God. Before we go, I have to ask you about the Acton Institute's Jimmy Lai documentary. We've covered uh, yes. Jimmy Lai's uh, terrible journey here. Uh, it, it, he was yeah. arrested for his Very sad. speaking out and, and wanting to protect democracy in Hong Kong. The documentary is called The Hong Konger. How is it being received? How can people see it? There are private showings right now because we're going through a series of film festivals before we uh, hopefully it'll be picked up by one of the streaming services or some other um, company. Um, it is being really very well received. The people who came out of the showings here uh, at the Acton University uh, were crying. Uh, they were deeply moved by it, yeah. and we have some of the people who were arrested, who are threatened to be arrested, Chinese people from Hong Kong. Uh, it's being very, very well received, and uh, I, I think it's a very powerful statement. People can go online to the Hong Konger and see a video clip of it, uh, and then uh, wait for us to come to a uh, town near you, and or wait for it to be streamed on Netflix or one of the other services. Okay. Have you heard from Jimmy or any of his family members about his welfare? How is he? How is he doing? Yes, uh, he's doing fine. Uh, as I mean, as fine as you can be in a prison cell. But let me right. tell you what he's doing is he is reading. He has asked for reading lists of uh, things that will deepen his spirituality. I mean, when a person is in this circumstance, like Cardinal Pell, like uh, uh, Cardinal Xavier Nguyen Van Thuan, uh, and a whole yeah. history of saints who have been in this, when they deepen their relationship with Christ, it fortifies them to give this effective witness, which is exactly what Jimmy Lai is doing now, at yeah. this moment. Excellent. Well, I can't wait to see the whole thing. Find out more about the Acton documentary, The Hong Konger, Jimmy Lai's Extraordinary Struggle for Freedom. It's at thehongkongermovie.com. And The Economics of the Parables, the latest book from Father Robert Sirico, is available now at bookstores and online at the Acton.org website. Thank you, Father. God bless.